Welcome to Atlanta Mix 108. I'm your host of Author Talk, ML Roostrack. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? It's good to be with you today. Oh, it, it's wonderful. So I have a little bit of your background here, and you started off as a chef. Yes, a little bit. 30 years of my life, a little bit. I, uh, <laughs> I'm... I'm uh, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, if you can't tell by the accent, but uh, you know, I uh, I came from a tough neighborhood in Brooklyn, and uh, I realized that I had to find a way, my way in life. So uh, I uh, in those days there was a magazine, gourmet magazine, a national magazine, and there was a very famous writer, Jay Jacobs. And uh, I started buying back issues of Cormet. And Jay Jacobs, when I read after a few issues, told me that the best restaurants in the United States were the French restaurants. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had said at those days that the best, one of the best restaurants was a restaurant in Manhattan, in midtown Manhattan, uh, named La Caravelle. And I said to myself, from, coming from Brooklyn, that if I was going to do it, I was going to do it with the best. Didn't re- had no, didn't matter that I didn't know what the what the hell I was doing. I had no experience. But you know, again, coming from Brooklyn, we knew how to BS our way through the front door. So I went to a local B. Dalton bookstore, <clears throat> bought, bought a couple of French cookbooks, and I memorized all the all the terms I could memorize, regardless of the fact. I didn't know how to pronounce the words. Right. And uh, showed up on Monday morning, and I started rattling off all these French terms to chef. And he looked at me like I had three heads. <laughs> and uh, needless to say, he threw me out. So, you know, the number 13 is uh, very unlucky. It's not a very yeah. unlucky n- number, but not for me. Because on the 13th time, believe it or not, I went back 13 times they finally hired me. And uh, so he must have figured, if I don't hire this guy, I'll never get rid of him. So uh, he hired me. I spent almost a year there. And at the end of the year, I was the only nun. Everybody was French in the kitchen. I was the only American in the kitchen. And at the end of the year, they told me uh, what a piece of uh, uh, garbage I was, that I wasn't French, that I had never worked in France. So after year, I said to the chef, you know, not for nothing. Uh, well, if, if I, I'm not, I can't become French, but well, why don't you send me to France? And he sent me to France. And I spent, uh, I spent 14 months at the Hotel Negresco in Nice. And, uh, and then I went uh, to a small restaurant in the southwest of France on the foothills of the Pyrenees. Um, mm. When there was a little French, who I called him a wizard. He was the greatest chef I had ever seen, I ever witnessed. His name was Michel Girard. And I worked with him. And he opened up my eyes to what cooking could be. I came back to the United States. Um, I went back to La Caravelle. I spent a couple more years. And at the age of 25, I took over La Caravelle, armed with all the insight that Gerard had, had given to me. And uh, I ended up becoming, um, at one point, the famed uh, winemaker, Robert Mondavi, was fine, looking for the 13th best chef in America, who he was going to put on TV. And I was one of the 13 that he picked as the best in America. And he put me a, gave me a half-hour television show. And I never looked back. I ended up with my own television series on PBS. I had two series on PBS. And then I really struck gold when, when uh, TV Food Network came calling. And at that time, there was a very homey uh, uh, f- uh, cook, chef on television. Her name was Sarah Moulton. And Sarah Moulton was doing a show on, on uh, Food Network called Cooking Live. It was a one-hour show where she also took television, uh, telephone calls. I says, uh, they, they called me. I says, you want, you want, would you like to, f-? there was a lot for one, uh, for someone to do five days a week 
live one-hour shows. She couldn't do it all the time. So the producer said to me, how would you like to fill in? Yeah, okay, mm. twist my arm. So mm. I filled in for her, but you see, that I was different. I was a wise guy. On television, I was, forget about it. No holds barred. I didn't even know. Right. I, uh, people would call in, I had fun with them. And, uh, but I, sometimes I would go a little too far. And one day, right before I was about to go on, direct the program and call me in. I figured that's it. They're going to throw me out. I'm never going to see Food Network again. And instead, she says to me, how would you like your own show? Or oh, what is this? Some guy thought it was some kind of gig. Maybe there was somebody in the closet. But uh, mm-hmm. she says, you know, we get a lot of a lot of mail about you. She said, more than half the mail hates your guts. And you want to give me my own show because some people hate my guts? She says, you know something? People that hate you are going to watch you more than the people that love you. And exactly. Here went Ruggiero to go. She gave me my own show, Ruggiero to go. And the rest was history. So, yeah, for the beginning of my life, I was a cook. And I, I got to tell you, it's the type of profession is not for everybody. But, no, it is not. So, no, I not. actually went to culinary art school. Was a manager know? for a while, had my nutrition license, and life decided to be an author instead. But you could appreciate what I'm going to say. It's not for everybody, but for the people that love it, and you have to love it, it's, it's a great career. It really is yes. a terrific career. And it enabled me. I met so many people in my time. Uh, I cooked for five U.S. presidents. I, you know, I rubbed elbows with people that in common life I would have never been in the same room with them. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, I hope to say that it, it added something to my writing and uh, all those experiences, you know, with these people and working in the kitchen. And like I said, so the next chapter of my life turned and I, I turned to being, I don't say I'm an author. I say I'm a, I'm a story. Uh, I am a storyteller. That's really you are. what I am. Yes. And uh, well, thank you. I take that as a, a supreme compliment. I really do. And I, I find myself. That's what I tell people. I'm a storyteller. I tell stories. And uh, God bless Grammarly and those other online uh, aids. Because if it wasn't for those, forget about it. I could never write. Um, I wasn't the type of kid that went to school. But uh, here I am, and I'm really happy happy to be with you on the radio. Well, I'm glad to have you here. Now, we did all your your wonderful author or cooking career. What led you into books? Well, I, uh, I like I said, I have an affection, an affinity for telling stories. Some may, people may say, there's no one to shut his mouth, but yes, I know that talk like to no end. I love to tell stories, and it was a natural progression. You know, I one thing that I love, mm-hmm. I and I did it for my first book. I love horror. I'm a, a horror aficionado. I grew up loving horror, so when I decided that, uh, you know, I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't stand behind the stove anymore. I said, I'm going to sit down. And tell one of my stories and put it onto paper. And that's what I did. And uh, uh, the first book I wrote uh, was called A A Wistful Tale of God's Men and Monsters. And it's it's not a a gory book. It's not one of those. That's not my thing. I like kind of like the classic, the classic type of tales. Um, And I also, the other thing I love... I love to incorporate real places and real people in fiction. I like that. I like if I write a reader, I write what I like to read. And I would love to read a book where I can actually identify, for instance, in the book, my first book there, I write about a cemetery in upstate New York. Uh, it's called Pine, Pinewood Cemeteries. And it's actually considered... Uh, one of the 10 most haunted places in America. Really, no jokes aside. And uh, it's got 
a muzzle. It's a, one of these turnitus been built in the early 1800s, has this mausoleum and stuff like that. Everything. It's got everything that you would want in a in a, uh, in a, in a haunted cemetery, right? And it's in a town called Brunswick, which I incorporate in the story, this real town, Brunswick. And it's just Brunswick itself is really perfect for haunted, uh, uh, a scary movie, a scary book, because it even has the little one-room house built in the early 1800s with supposedly uh, a haunted girl, little girl, uh, her ghost, that suppose people see when they drive there by every once in a while. So I had all the framework there for a book, and I incorporated my story into it. And uh, I think it's the kind of book if you read, if you watch the movie Sleepy Hollow or one of those, it's that kind of a genre of Sahara where I you would pick up every. It's perfect for Halloween. It's the kind okay. of book that I hope that people will pick up every Halloween to read to their kids and stuff like that. And uh, I really, really enjoyed uh, doing it. I uh, had a lot, of fun, a lot of fun doing it. And I think because I had a lot of fun, hopefully it translates uh, into success. So I, that was I'm sure it will. Now, I mean, I, I've had a, the pleasure at least skimming through some of it, and it's a wonderful book. It's Thank you. Just has just enough edgy creepiness to it that you can be in the story and be scared l- listening to it or watching it um, in your head when you're reading. During a yes. thunderstorm, it would be a perfect time setting to read that book. Yeah, curling up, get nice hot chocolate, you know what I mean? Get that mm-hmm. under the covers and read the book. That's the kind of book that uh, I tried to where I tried to write. And, and I uh, think you succeeded perfectly. Well, thank you. Now you say to yourself, now I'm going to make you laugh. You say to yourself, how do you, how do you top that one, right? You write a horror book. How do you top that one? Well, my next book is coming out uh, this coming June. And uh, same, uh, same publisher and everything. It's, uh, but I didn't write another horror book. No. Some kid from Brooklyn, right? What would he write? I wrote a romance. <laughs> I, yeah, I wrote a romance. Now, again, we're keeping in line. We're keeping the same uh, uh, live, real place. Real, mm-hmm. I try to incorporate real people, right? Mm-hmm. And growing up in Brooklyn, the year 1977, think about okay. that. It's really the most, for New York, I can't speak for Atlanta, but for New York, 1977 was the most tumultuous year that maybe New York had ever seen. In 1977, right, Mm -hmm. it started with disco, right? It was the year of disco when Saturday Night Fever premiered in 1977. We also had the Son of Sam running around New York, uh, tormenting New Yorkers. And uh, we also had a garbage stress, citywide garbage strike, citywide police strike. And finally, to top that one, top that all off, we had the blackout of 1977 in New York. We had the middle of July in 102 degree heat. Um, New York went dark for two days. And it, it, it resulted in the worst, um, the worst uh, rioting and, and, uh, and, uh, um, looting uh, in the history of the city. So I, that's the backdrop for romance mm-hmm. for me. And it's, uh, I grew up, when I was a kid, I grew up, I was a fighter. I fought in the ring. I fought amateur and pro. So my, the kid in the, the story, the Italian kid from Brooklyn, 1977, who's also a fighter, and uh, hanging out in the discos in those days. I feel bad for kids today. I got to tell you, not to have the discos like we had growing up. Mm, what a true. shame. I mean, the worst thing in the world is these uh, these uh, these telephones, these I, these uh, these smartphones where they sit around, they text hello to each other, goodbye, how you doing? You look good. And our day, forget about it. 
We're in a disco. We hung out. We smoothed with the girls. The girls smoothed with the guys. So here is this uh, this Italian kid, this young fighter from Brooklyn, and uh, he finds his true love, young Italian girl named Gia. And it's it's kind of a Shakespearean. Um, I don't want to give the story away, but right. it's the it's the it's the romance. It's but also with that backdrop with the son of Sam. Son of Sam. This is true. This is not fiction. He was. There was a there was a New York City had a daily called which it still has the Daily News, and there was a very famous writer at the Daily News named Jimmy Breslin, and the son of Sam uh, did, um, was writing was writing uh, letters to him, and in these letters he would challenge the police. He 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 like put the police down. I think down I remember that case. Yes, and he would. He told the police, "You can't catch me." This and that. He murdered quite a few people. Um, in fact, he he focused on um, dark-haired, short-haired young girls, and it, uh, you know what it it caused? It caused. I mean, long-haired, uh, dark-haired girls. It caused girls to cut their hair and dye their hair, just to avoid not to be murdered by this guy. He would kill young lovers sitting in the in, in cars, you know, in those days. And uh, anyway, he wrote to Jimmy Breslin in one of his most infamous letters. He says that uh, he was going to buy sneakers for the police because they were running after him so much, never catch him. He would buy them as sneakers. But in this very ominous letter, he signed it, Say Goodbye and Good Night. And that's the title of my book, Say Goodbye and Good Night. And in this, during the story, I present to the reader different evil entities hovering around, and then the son of Sam is one of them in the darkness. And the young boy has to has to uh, circumvent these evils and so forth. So again, I can't tell you no more because I'll give the story. But uh, it's coming out in June. It's a it's a really it's a it's a fun it's 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 a uh, it's a really nice read, really nice read, and I think uh, hope everybody goes out and buys that too. Because I got about forty-two kids, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta support. So I need to sell as many books as I can here. So <laughs> anyway, there, I, I'm sure this won't be an, a bestseller. I mean, you, your work, you take fiction, put reality in it, have real places. Is everything that we need to be captivated captivated, drawn in, and wanting more. I I hope so. That's what I do. And uh, I think that uh, I, I, I found my, you know, I don't want to, I don't know if you would say style, but I found my kind of way of writing. And, uh, and I feel very comfortable in that. And that uh, is I like to incorporate the real places and so forth. It kind of gives me when I look at a story, it gives me the framework, uh, framework to to work within, and uh, it makes at least it it facilitates my my uh, my writing, and uh, and I, like I said, I don't know if you would call the style, but I think that would be my style that I incorporate uh, the the the, uh, the real things into it, and uh, so well, I write about it, places I know, right. And it works well for you. Thank you, thank you, and uh, yeah, it's it's, it's uh, it, it works out good. And uh, but uh, so I enjoy it, and uh, uh, you know, I got to finally. So the last couple of things I'm doing, I got to. I'm on your show. I'm going to plug as much as I can. Right, um, I am returning to the horror in November. I got a another horror book coming out. And then in the fall, uh, early winter, I have my memoir coming out. And uh, it's a tell-all book. And uh, it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's actually uh, been optioned for, uh, for film. And uh, I, I tell all the, the, uh, the good and the bad. You can't tell half the story. So I tell the good and the bad of, uh, of my life. And uh, what it was growing up, and so forth. 
and uh, so I thought it's called high crimes, uh, hoax, high crimes and hoax cuisine. And uh, you know, it's uh, my life is uh, is kind of a contradiction. You know, I grew up in where I grew up in Brooklyn uh, was called Vanderveer Projects. Uh, it was the worst federally funded um, housing project in the country in those days. And uh, I grew up in a place in Brooklyn. And I say the street because a lot of your, your listeners will, will recognize it. I grew up on Nostrand and Newkirk in Brooklyn. And that area, that, that intersection was made famous by, uh, by Biggie Smalls, the rapper. Biggie yeah. Smalls used to rap about Nostrand Avenue all the time. And uh, it was a tough area I grew up in. And uh, so I tell the stories of what it was like to grow up in that area. You know, uh, by the time I was 10 years old, I'd been arrested six times. And uh, I, uh, I uh, did everything from, I used to do the, the raise, I used to make money when I was a kid running tree card Monty games. I don't know if people in your, in your listening world knows what the tree card Monty is. Those are tree cards. We used to run around with cardboard boxes and tree cards, and you had to pick the ace of spades. And uh, the cards were folded. It was a sleight of hand. No right. one ever won. And uh, so I did that. I did all kinds of stuff. And it led to different things. And uh, I wasn't a good kid. And But I found my way, like I had told you. And I... Uh, I went to France and so forth. So that's my book, my memoir. It'll be coming out in the fall. And uh, well, that'll be excellent because you have, when you were a troubled child, teen, and you brought yourself up to become something. Those are the yeah. best stories. Well, uh, you know, you got the choice. You either lift yourself up and you do what you got to do, or you end up in prison with that. That was the choices and, uh, when I was growing up. There wasn't much other choices. But, uh, you know, Brooklyn was a, was a – today it's a kind of it's kind of funny, you know. You, really, you, you watch Brooklyn on TV today, and it's this kind of glorified place. Mm-hmm. Now, so today I almost don't recognize Brooklyn, what they talk about. But back in the day, it was a, it was a tough place. But it was a colorful place. It was a type of place that uh, the, there was characters behind every turn. And those characters really lended themselves um, to, to writing. And, uh, you know, it's those type of colorful people that uh, create, I believe, the game best characters for books, especially in fiction. I mean, some people don't want, you know, they don't want you to tell you their real story. But the defense of fictional carrier, a lot of those people were terrific uh, to become fictional characters. So it was a, it was a, it was something else. Well, I, we wouldn't have the literature today. We wouldn't have the culture today without the people from that grew up when Brooklyn was a lot harder than it is now. That's true. That way. Very true. Very, very true. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a, it was something else. But uh, mm-hmm. so those those are the books I got coming out uh, in the fall. This coming fall. Well, you have a wonderful collection starting, and I foresee you having many, many, many more books coming out because. Like you said, you're a storyteller. You have lots of stories to tell. Yeah, I have no clue. Yeah, I have no idea what uh, I don't know how many uh, cockamamie stories I got to tell in my uh, <laughs> in, uh, in, 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 behind the behind the curtain. You know, it's uh, right. But I, we never know. I enjoy it. Yeah, I enjoy n- writing. Well, it's fun. I mean, it's a way to express yourself, a way to get your story out there but at the same time we never know what's behind our curtain until we write it absolutely absolutely and uh it's uh it's uh it's just you know it's, it's 
just a, just a, for wizard, it's just been a, it's been a good gas ride uh, growing mm-hmm. up the way I live and the life that I have. And it uh, it's a good learning yes. experience, but it also gives you a lot of things that you can write about in different things. I mean, you take Brooklyn, you take your backdrop for your romance, you have all these different things you have because of the life experiences that you had growing up until now. Absolutely. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's absolutely true, completely true. What you say? Mhm. So, looking back, what is the hardest skill you had to learn relating to your book writing? It was particularly when uh, you know writing my memoir is to just kind of being comfortable in my own skin. When I wrote my memoir, I think that uh, that was the most difficult thing was being 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 comfortable in my own skin. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I uh, my being uh, being able to tell the story. You know, I had to start, you know, as a kid and stuff like that. I had to relive my my youth, and it was not easy. Uh, you know, I. My father was jailed before I was born. Uh, when I was four years old, I found my younger sister dead. Mm. When I was five, I watched my mother die. She was pregnant. It was just me and my sister left alone in the world. Mm. And uh, I didn't meet my father till I was 13 when he got out of jail. My father was ended up being a very infamous heroin trafficker in New York City, in the tri-state area. And, uh, you know, when my father got out of jail, he felt that it was, uh, that I should follow in his footsteps. And uh, I was a bad kid, like I had told you. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was not easy to write about these things. A lot of bad things went on. You know, I, uh, I, you know, I, I had one of my dear friends, you know, yeah, I watched so many of my friends die or go to jail. I had a very dear friend. His name was Caesar. And you know, when someone, when a mother calls a, a boy Caesar, you better mm-hmm. hope this kid ends up being a, being a tough kid, like a big tough kid. He's not a pipsqueak with glasses with a name like Caesar because he'd be, forget about it, be there, they would, unmercifully they go after him. But mm-hmm. Caesar was... Uh, Third place in Mr. America when I was a kid. He was a big, big, big dude. And uh, we ended up working in a very, very famous club in Brooklyn, a disco. And uh, we worked the door, me and Caesar. And in those days, finding a girl wasn't hard. And right. uh, you know, the, those were the things. It was a different, different era, the disco era. And, uh, you know, I have to write stories that were very, very hard. You know, as Caesar ends up with a young girl that's uh, the the, uh, the girlfriend of a of a mob boss in Brooklyn, of and uh, he's warned not to uh, not to go near the girl to to walk away. And uh, guys had come down from this guy, the boss was from the Bronx, and mm-hmm. guys had come down from the Bronx and talked to a friend of my father's and told me that I was to bring Caesar to a restaurant on a on a Thursday night, and I knew what that meant. I went back to Caesar. I said, well, Caesar, listen to me. You guys are not messing around. you got to disappear. And he thought it was a joke, and uh, he didn't listen to me. And uh, that Thursday night, that for the next that Friday morning, Caesar was found behind in his car under the Arizona Bridge with two bullets in his head. And it's very, very hard to go through and rewrite all those things. So to answer your question, you know, you gotta get, I had to get comfortable on my own skin when I wrote this memoir. And a lot of stories like that. It wasn't easy to relive. And, no. Uh, yeah. And it culminates the stories 
my memoir culminates with the death of my son. And that was the hardest thing to, to write about. Really was not, you know, it's, uh, it, it's the kind of thing that kind of to read it, to write it, tears you apart. But I felt that it was necessary to tell the story. So Some, sometimes we have to write those stories just so we can finish healing. We, yeah. it's not that we're moving past it, but we're ready to heal, or at least start to heal. Well, this is very true, and uh, the story is the book is. Uh, I think people will find it uh, a roller coaster ride, a true roller coaster ride to read that book. And that'll be coming out in the fall. Well, I look forward to reading it when it comes out, so please let me know when it does so I can look for it. I will. Great. In the meantime, where can our readers find you in your books? Well, um, of course, the, all the, the regular places that you buy books, your favorite place, to, whether it's Barnes & Noble, Amazon, so forth. Or you can visit... Um, See where I'm going to be, my upcoming uh, like uh, appearances and stuff. RuggieroBooks.com. It's R U G G E R I O Books B O O K S dot com, and you can find give I give giveaways, stuff like that, and you stay in tune with me, and uh, maybe you'll find a funny story here and there. Well, funny stories are right always entertaining when we go on on an author's website so oh, thank you well, I oh, okay. we'll, uh... <laughs> well we have so many stories to tell sometimes we just put a joke on our website to see if anyone's paying attention yeah <laughs> so yeah dot com. there you see all upcoming appearances in the books and so forth now I know you have the three books coming out is there, are you planning to write either another romance or horror book anytime soon I think that uh, I think I enjoy writing horror so uh, I have the, 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 the horror cause of the uh, next horror coming out in uh, November 22nd and uh, and then I'm exploring the possibilities of what's the what's what nightmare can I conjure up and uh, so I'm working on that. What's the next nightmare? Mm. Well, being in New York, you have several errors you can choose from, right? Oh, yeah, a lot of nightmares here in New York. Forget about it. I'm sure <laughs> there's a few in Atlanta, too. But we got our, our share of nightmares over here. So uh, there's, uh, there's, there's actually one particular place. I'm, there's a, I'm not going to give away the whole story, but the next uh, my next uh, target for the next book is a uh, very infamous in Long Island, which is the area right side of the, right, right outside of New York. Okay. There's a um, very f- infamous um, psychiatric hospital that's now closed. Huge. There's got to be maybe on uh, nearly 30 acres of uh, this hospital where supposedly all kinds of crazy things went on and the evil experiments and so forth. And uh, I've been breaking the law. I've been jumping the fence at night and going around with my phone on, the the camera on my phone, and researching the next horror, which I think will be centered in this psychiatric hospital called Pilgrim State in uh, New York. So I think that uh, gives me a lot of fodder for horror here. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I think I know what psychiatric hospital spittle you're talking about because it's been uh, featured on Ghost Adventures at least once. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of fonder in New York just for horror stories. I mean, you can pick any, almost any decade. You have some type of murder or something that's surreal at, at the time and you're looking back and the some things are still unsolved. Oh, you've got a lot of sick maniacs running around New York. Plenty of, plenty of material here going on to write more horror. So, yeah, the romance, I don't know where that came out of, but I had fun writing it. But uh, my my, uh, my, uh, my journey is still on horror. It will be on horror. I think that's what uh, 
I've had psychic people say, oh, yeah, that sick maniac, he writes horror books. So uh, a lot of crazy yeah. people in the world. Well, we'll have to see, keep track of you to see if any of your horror books make it to the big screen. Because really from what I've read, and I like again, again, I just skin over just enough to get a feeling of the book. It's something that can rival Stephen King on, on the big screen, but without the blood and gore. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. That's that's quite a compliment, and I appreciate that. Anytime you're you're mentioned in the same vein as uh, that as Stephen King, who's one of my favorite authors, that's quite a compliment, and I do appreciate that. Well, I don't give out too many compliments that are that high up, but it, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd be out of a job if I did. <laughs> but no, <laughs> ser- seriously, it, it can rival some of his work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it was awesome having you on the show today. I hope to have you back when the next horror book comes out and I have time to read the whole thing because... I love my horror books. I love my horror movies. I I think that uh, down deep, I think uh, most people like some type of uh, be scared some way. Not everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, the, everybody has their own level of uh, uh, the, the amount of fear they want to touch. And, uh, right. So I think that everybody has that uh, has some type of affinity to, to being scared. And mm-hmm. uh, so. I think I'm on the right track. You are, because it's not the slasher, gory things. It's the intense emotion that you're triggering, and that's the difference, and that's where you need the, you're very good and excelling at touching someone that way. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I you're appreciate very welcome. that. And again, we're... Thank you so much for being on the show. And we are, and we can, this is David, say say your name one more time. I'm going to butcher your last name. Nice, nice Italian, a nice Italian name, Ruggiero. Of course. (laughs) And, And we'll have you back as soon as we get that next horror movie, or horror book out. Right. I'm sorry. See, I'm jumping Thank the gun you. with movies already. <laughs> hey, maybe a movie too. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it's it's whoever's listening in Chicago and hey, tell all of the place. You're listening in. Call me collect. No and a problem, nice Italian man. boy like me listening, Mr. Regario. I grew <laughs> up in New York myself. I grew up in New York myself. I was there during the 77 blackout. I got a Where nice Italian from? name too. I grew up in Harlem. Well, then you you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. My my aunt during the blackout, my aunt came and got me and took me to New Jersey, so that I wouldn't be involved with the blackout. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, and you know that that was sometime. That was the, that oh, that yeah. year was something else. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to say that, Mrs. Rusak. I remember the times that he was talking about. Of New course, York. That's, what, that's why we do these live shows. That way people like you can chime in at any time during the show. I didn't know it at the time, Mr. Regario, but I was related to the Gambino. I always thought I had a strange life, though. You know what I mean? Really? You were related to them? Yeah, still is, unfortunately. There's some good and some bad in that. I'm in Cleveland right now, Mr. Regeria. Just to put a little oh, bit yeah. more, you know, twist into the into the um they got a stronghold in Cleveland too. Uh-huh. Well, I love, Cleveland is a place I like very much. Uh the only problem is with you guys, you can't get your football team together. What's up with that? Oh, you, know, you said we can't get what the football team. They don't want to get it no, together. No. It's a money maker. It's a money maker. They don't want to get it together. <laughs> well, listen, if they got it together, people may actually want to go to the the games. 
Well, how, how else would they embezzle so much money if it may if they didn't have it brown? Well, look, we gave you a gift. We sent you over Beckham, Odell Beckham. Yeah, well, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure, Miss Rusak, just hearing the interview. And I, I'm yeah. gonna make Mr. Regario an offer after the phone conversation over to try to help him go a little further. I've already discussed this with Desiree. But, I mean, it's, it's just something that I want to do for Mr. Regario. Salute, Mr. Regario. What's that? Salute. I said salute. Oh, salute. Salute. salute to you, my friend. Thanks so much for everything. And we will talk to you later, and I'll let Myron talk to you about what he's wanting to do. Okay. All right, very good. And have a nice evening. You too. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Have a good you night. You as well. Bye-bye.